Um, so everything Michelle Goodwin has ever written uh, has been really crucial for me to understand reproductive justice, particularly her book, Policing the Womb, really helped me wrap my head around the criminalization of pregnancy and abortion here in the United States and, and the disparities within that. Um, Loretta Ross's work about reproductive justice and the term reproductive justice and how we understand reproductive justice as a framework um, was, was also crucial. She has like a primer on reproductive justice that helped me when I was sort of just starting out um, reporting on abortion rights. Um, also, uh, um, Dorothy Roberts' uh, Killing the Black Body is a must read for anyone who wants to understand um, reproductive justice and uh, particularly like the history of the inequality against uh, black women and black women's bodies. Um, and then probably Robin Marty's work. So Handbook for Poster America is really great. I really have a lot of respect for her as, as an activist and as someone who's been thinking about, okay, you know, what happens after Roe falls? Um, so I'm one of those people who like doesn't believe in there's such a thing as bias-free journalism. Uh, and the book is very much a work of journalism. Um, so, you know, I come to my work with my own blind spots and my own privilege as a white cis woman. Um, so it was very, very important to me to not only read these works, but also to reach out to the authors and and check my framing and make sure that that I was getting everything right because, you know, my background does influence my work and I did want this, I felt very strongly this work should be inclusive beyond me or readers like me. So globally, Roe versus Wade um, established the possibility of abortion as a human right. Um, so that's not what the ruling said specifically. It grounded abortion rights in a right to privacy, but it was an important first step toward us considering abortion as a human right globally, I think. Um, and it, it just like set a really important framework. That said, you know, Roe is now dead. Um, and I think that presents something of an opportunity for us to start imagining what the next version of Roe could be and how it could be more inclusive and how it could be, um, how it could actually be grounded in a right to reproductive autonomy instead of, you know, something that's kind of one step removed. Um, and I think that could also be really useful on a global scale, right? Because obviously like women don't just live in the United States. Uh, people with uteruses don't just live in the United States. So yeah, I mean, that's kind of my dream for what happens next. Um, but I do, I do want to be very clear that I'm not one of those people who was like, who has ever felt like Roe had to fall for us to improve this. And I do think that the consequences are, are severe and they're devastating. And the people who are suffering the most are the people who have been disempowered for a long time in this country um, and globally. So, um, but, you know, like, I think we also have to like figure out ways to get out of bed in the morning amid this. So, you know, like I really, I really dream a dream of, of Roe as much better in the future and really grounded in the right to reproductive autonomy for all people. I think, yes, people, particularly abortion rights folks, feel protective of people who are getting abortions and that's great and that's human and you know, I would never like discourage that. But I do think that sometimes we should take a step back and interrogate that feeling. So when when it comes to a point where it's more about making oneself feel good than it is about actually doing a service to the patient, that's kind of where we start to get into like a saviorism complex, right? Um, 
abortion clinics have been around for a long time. They've been doing the work for a long time. They know what their patients need, right? Often what their patients need is to just like get in and not hear more noise and get out and move on with their lives. Um, a counter protest, for example, isn't really conducive to that. So I think that it's really important for, you know, those of us who are directly involved in abortion work to really listen to those who are, because they know what needs to happen and they know like the best way to support patients. Um, so I would say that's always a good place to start, like listen to what advocates are saying they need. Um, donating to local abortion funds is a great way to support patients who need abortion care. Um, because particularly now in the United States, at least, uh, it's gotten so much more expensive for people to be able to get abortions. So many more people are having to travel out of state. And so you think about cost of gas or a plane ticket or a hotel stay, child care, food, all that stuff really adds up. Um, so by donating to an abortion fund, you can really directly help people through mutual aid. Um, that's not to say clinic escorting isn't helpful. Um, but again, I, I think it's important to, to reach out with kind of an open mind if you're interested in that. And, and if they tell you like, no, we're good, here's something else that you should be doing to help accept that. I think also it's important for us to learn how to talk about abortion without stigma. So talking about abortion as a normal medical procedure, because that's what it is, uh, using the word abortion when that's what we're talking about, um, just like you would use the word colonoscopy or um, gallbladder surgery, because it's just another medical procedure. Um, that's not to say that anyone owes the world their abortion story, people get to have boundaries and get to like decide what's right for them and stigma is real and risk is real and varies among populations. Um, but I do think that the more that we have really frank conversations about abortion and the more that we normalize it, the better off we'll all be.